day that nothing happened. Sometimes silence surpasses all other preparations. Tonight's class is dedicated in the loving memory of a young friend of mine, Nasanata Rebzalman Yudha Deitch, who was tragically taken from us last Sunday on Lagba Omer. The class is also dedicated by David and Ida Schattenstein in the loving memory of the Mumbai Kedoshim and Rabbi Gabi and Rivka Holtzberg and in the loving memory of a young soul, Alta Shula, Swerdlov, Ben Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak and Hindel, Tehei Nishmasam Tzruda, May their souls be bound up in the eternal bond of life. And may God comfort their loved ones among the mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. I think I once shared with you the anecdote about the Jew who was looking for spirituality. And as you know, unfortunately, many Jews, often young Jews, lament that it's very hard to find spirituality within the infrastructure of Jewish institutions. So this young man, like many young Jews in recent decades, traveled to the Far East and goes into an ashram where he begins to meditate to engage in all of the spiritual practices of the Far East. And after years of initiation and training and discipline and spiritual work and progress, he decides he wants to become a Buddhist monk. So he's ushered in into that special ashram and the His mentor, his spiritual mentor, guru, tells him, listen, you can become a monk, but it takes a lot of work. For one, you can only speak once in five years. Every five years, you can open your mouth and say two words. If you're ready, great. If not, quit now. And this young Jew says, I'm in. And the process begins. For five years, he does not utter a word. Finally, after five years, Nu, what are your two words? And he turns to his guru and he says, Food, horrible. Okay. The next five years pass, he doesn't say a word, Nu. It's time to talk. He says, mattress, horrible. Okay. Another five years pass. It's now 15 years since he came in. And once again, it's time for him to speak. New, he says, I quit. So his guru turns to him and says, It's about time you quit. 
all you have been doing since you came is complaining. There is a enigmatic and intriguing episode recorded in the Talmud concerning the holiday of Shavuos. Six weeks after the Jewish people leave Egypt on the 15th day of the Hebrew month of Nisan, which we call Passover, Pesach, in the year 1313 before the Common Era, or in the Jewish calendar, 2448 years since creation, six weeks after their departure from Egypt, they're standing at the foot of a mountain known as Mount Sinai. The first day of the month of Sivan, they arrive at the feet of Mount Sinai. And in the 19th chapter of the book of Shemais Exodus, the Torah describes their preparations for that moment of revelation at Mount Sinai. And the Talmud in Shraktate Shabbos, analyzing and dissecting the text in the portion of Yisroi, 19th chapter of Exodus, pieces together and presents to us a chronicle of events that occurred during those first six days of the Hebrew month of Sivan, as the Jewish people were preparing for the revelation at Sinai when the Torah was given to the entire nation of Israel. Let us see how the Talmud chronicles these events. Please open up your curriculum. Right below the video there is a PDF curriculum which you can open up and bring up source number one. Zag de Gemara, Shabbos, Daf, Pei, Vav, Amid, Beis. Tana Rabban on the rabbis taught, V'shishi b'chaydish nitnu asaras adibris li Yisrael. On the sixth day of the month of the Hebrew month of Sivan, the Ten Commandments were given to Israel. Rabbi Yossi Oimer b'shivabai. The great Talmudic sage Rabbi Yossi argues, he believes that the Ten Commandments were communicated not on the sixth day, but on the seventh day of the month of Sivan. Everybody agrees that the Jews arrived to the desert Sinai where the mountain Sinai was when on Rosh Chodesh, which is the head of the month, the first day of the month of Sivan, the Jewish people arrived. The difference between the two opinions then is that according to Rabbi Yossi, the preparations went for six days and the Torah was given on the seventh day. According to the sages, the preparation went for five days and the Torah was given on the sixth day. And the Talmud begins to explain the opinion of the rabbis, which is the predominant opinion. It was a Monday. The first day of the month of Sivan was a Monday. And on that Monday, the first day of the month, Moses did not tell the Jews a thing because of the weariness of their journey. They just arrived to Mount Sinai, they were weary, they were weak as a result of their journey, and therefore he said nothing to them. Bitlasa on Tuesday, Omar Lahem Va'atem Tiuli. He told them those words from God, you become from me a kingdom of princes and a holy nation. Barba on Wednesday, Omar Lu Mitzvah he gave them the mitzvah of boundaries that they must fence off the mountain and not approach it. Behei, on Thursday, Avud Prisha, he commanded them to separate from marital intimate relations with their spouses. Now, let's see this chronicle of events explained more specifically in source number two. This is from Shulchan Aruch Harav, the Code of Jewish Law, written by Rabbi Shnei Zalman of Liadi, Erechayim, the end of Simon Tov Tzadak Dalad, the end of the section 494. It's customary in our countries not to confess our sins from the first day of the month of Sivan until and including the eighth day, which means 
till after Isru Chag, which is the day after the holiday. The holiday of Shavuos outside of Israel is two days Vav, the 6th of Sivan, the 7th of Sivan. The day after is the 8th till after the 8th. We don't confess our sins. In his Siddur, in his prayer book, Rabbi Shnei Zalman writes, he brings the custom of many other communities that you don't confess the sins till after the 12th day of the month of Sivan. But here it follows the custom that till the 8th day you don't confess your sins, including the 8th day. Why? Right after the first day of Sivan, Moses began dealing with the Jews and preparing them to receive the Torah. Here he's now quoting the Talmud and Shabbos, page 86, which we just learned. On Monday was the first day of the month. On Tuesday, which is the second day of Sivan, This is when Moses comes down from the mountain. He goes up on the mountain and he comes down and he tells the Jewish people in the name of God that if you follow and enter into my covenant and you follow my commandments, you will become an Am Segula, a special chosen nation, and you will be for me, Mamleches Koyanim V'goy Kaddish, a kingdom of princes and a holy nation. That's why this day, the second day of the month of Sivan, is known in Jewish tradition as Yom HaMeyuchas, the day of designation, when the Jewish people got their Yichas, their designation as a kingdom of princes and a holy nation. This has become their moral task and mandate to serve as a holy nation among the nations of the world. On Wednesday, Moses comes down and tells them the mitzvah of Hagbalah, which is boundaries, limitations. Make sure you do not touch the mountain. And that's when there are borders. Moses is the only one who can go on the mountain. Aaron, his brother, can approach the mountain a little more than others. The Kohanim, the priest, can approach it more than others. And the rest of the Jews remain further behind, but the boundaries must be clearly designated. On Thursday, he gave them the commandment of Prisha that they must segregate from marital intimate relations with their wives. Today, Thursday, Machar, tomorrow, Friday, which is the fifth day of the month of Sivan. And they should be prepared for the third day, which is Shabbos, the day that the Torah was given. Everybody holds that the Shabbos, Nitna Torah, the Talmud says. Everybody holds that the Ten Commandments were given to the Jewish people on Saturday, on the day of Shabbos. The difference between the opinion of the sages and Rabbi Yossi is, according to Rabbi Yossi, the first day of the month was a Sunday. And Sunday Moses didn't tell them a thing because they were weary from the journey. Monday is the day he began communicating to them the commandments and the Torah was given on Shabbos, which is the seventh day of Sivan. According to the sages... The first day of the month of Sivan was on Monday. Moses did not tell them a thing that day, because they were weary from their journey. Tuesday is the day he began communicating to them. Tuesday he told them about their designation as a holy nation if they enter into the covenant with God. Wednesday he gave them the commandment to make borders around the mountain and not approach it. Thursday he commanded them to refrain from intimacy for two days, for Thursday and Friday, to immerse in a mikveh, and on Shabbat, be ready for Shabbos, the day that the Torah was given. According to Rabbi Yossi, the Talmud says, Moses actually told them on Wednesday to refrain from intimate relations, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and be ready for the day of Shabbos. According to Rabbi Yossi, Moses added one day of intimate, of segregation, uh, although God told them only you should separate today and tomorrow and be ready for the third day, which according to the rabbis is today is Thursday and Friday, and then be ready for Shabbos. Rabbi Yossi says it's Wednesday and Thursday, and Moses, he added one day based on his, from, his own, uh, from his own perspective, based on his own consent, his own ideas. So we have here the chronicle of events. We have what happened on Monday. Actually nothing. Moses said nothing. We have what happened on Tuesday. He designated them, gave them their special designation. We have what happened on Wednesday. 
the limitations around the mountain. We know what happens on Thursday. He commands them to uh, disengage from intimate relations. And then you have Friday. Friday is the fifth day of Sivan. The Talmud explains that day Moses built an altar. He offered sacrifices. And that day they entered into the covenant, all the Jewish people declared Nasiv and Ishma, we will do and we will understand. And finally, Shabbos morning, on the sixth day of the month of Sivan, God descends into the mountain with the sound of the shofar, with the lightnings, with the great sounds, with the smoke and the fire, and communicates to the entire Jewish nation the Ten Commandments, beginning with the word, Anoichi Hashem Alekecha, I am your God. Now, what is strange here is the fact that on the first day of the month of Sivan, which is, according to the rabbis, which day is it? It's on Monday. Or according to Rabbi Yoisi, who holds that the Torah was given on the seventh day, on Shabbos, it was Sunday. But either Sunday or Monday. According to all opinions, Moses did not say a word. They came there, and he told them nothing, not even a word. Why? Because they're weary. They just traveled. They came from a place called Rifidim. They arrived at Mount Sinai. He says nothing. He waits one day, and only the next day, on the second day of Sivan, does Moses communicate to, to them the great message that their task would be to be a kingdom of princes and a holy nation. Now, the giving of the Torah was not just a minor incidental event in Jewish history. The moment God first designated Moses at the burning bush to go liberate the Jewish people from Egypt, he told them immediately, You're not just going to set them free from physical bondage, from, sub, from slave labor to Pharaoh and his legions. But rather, when you leave, when you take this nation out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain, on Mount Sinai. In other words, the journey to Torah was essential to the whole Exodus experience. When Moses promised them redemption, he didn't only promise them redemption from the tyranny of Pharaoh and Egypt. He promised them ultimate redemption, which is redemption from their mortality. Redemption from their finite existence. Redemption from the burden of living in a material, confined world. Ultimate redemption. The ability to be able to touch the divine, to experience eternity, to touch truth. To build a fragment of heaven on planet Earth. Redemption through Torah, God's wisdom. God's gift. In fact, the moment they left Egypt, they began a count, counting each day when they approached the mountain. Open up source number three. This is a beautiful tradition quoted in Rabbeinu Nisim at the end of Talmud Psachim, Zagderan. Source number three. We have a tradition, a Midrashic tradition. That Bishash Amar la Moshe Tavdin Asalakim al Haraza Amrula Yisrael Moshe Rabbeinu Emosi Avaydazu. From when Moses told Israel that when you leave Egypt you will serve God on this mountain, they asked him, When will this happen? Amar la Hamla Saif Hamishim Yoim. So when they left Egypt, he finally told them, At the end it will be after 50 days. From the day they leave Egypt, it's 50 days. Every single Jew was counting. One day passed, two days passed, three days, four days. Hence the sages instituted the mitzvah of the counting of the Omer. We know from the second day of Passover we begin a 49-day count. Each day we count and yet add one more day. Finally, we finish the 49-day count. When? On the fifth day of Sivan, one day before the holiday of Shavuos, and the 50th day is the holiday of Shavuos when the Torah was given. Why do we count these days? I mean, counting days is, uh, is, is a good thing. It's good for people to be, um, to be sensitive, to be mindful of time that passes. It was Aristotle who asked his students once, who is the greatest teacher, the greatest profoundest teacher who imparts the 
deepest and most everlasting lessons to his students, but this teacher also kills all of his students. And the answer, of course, is time. There's no teacher like time, but time kills also all of its students. So to be mindful of time is essential to life and essential to a productive life and a meaningful life. People who are uh, chaotic, it's very hard for them to function productively, meaningfully. But why these days? You should always count your days. No, these 49 days we counted between Passover and Shavuos. So the Ran explains because this is a commemoration of the Jewish people count the first year. They were counting the days. And why were they counting? It's like when you tell a child, you know, in two weeks we're going on this trip. So every day they count. You know, one day passed, two days passed, three days passed. We're getting closer and closer until they come finally to the last week, to the last days, and they make a countdown. Ah! Now we have reached our destination, we have reached the great moment we have eagerly anticipated with bated breath. And this was the story of the Jewish people. They were counting each day. And the Iran continues and says, So we count also a 50-day count, 49, and then the holiday, for the joy of Torah like the Jewish people were counting at that time. If this is the case, we all know from our own lives that when you're eagerly anticipating something, so two things happen. Number one, the closer you reach to your destination, the more excited you get. The less time remaining for that ultimate moment, the more passion, the more enthusiasm, the more excitement. That's human nature. Another element in human nature we see is that when we are eagerly anticipating something, even if we are exhausted and we are physically weary and tired, that exhaustion does not play a major role in our life and would not prevent us from doing anything we need to prepare and usher in this great moment which we have been anticipating for such a long time. If so, the question is, the Jewish people have already been told in Egypt right in the beginning, you're not just leaving one country, you're going to come to a mountain to receive the Torah and enter into a relationship with God where you will be redeemed, not just from physical bondage, but also from the bondage of human mortality of a human earthly life divorced from the source of reality and the source of life. From their leaving Egypt six weeks ago, they have been eagerly counting every day. Now they reach the place, Mount Sinai, Midbar Sinai, they come to the place where Mount Sinai is. Wow, this is the mountain we have been hearing about for who knows how long. This is the place where civilization will be changed for eternity. Not just our own story, our own narrative will be transformed. The history of civilization will be transformed. And suddenly, Moses will not tell them a single thing. As the Talmud says, Not a single word about the events. Not a single word about what is awaiting them. Not a single word about how they can prepare themselves. Why? Because they were weary from their journey. Does that make sense after such eager anticipation? He wouldn't even tell them a single word about anything. Not even a mention. Not even a statement. Not even a declaration. And what about from the Jewish perspective? How were they so complacent? How did they allow Moses to get away with it, so to speak, and not demand from him? Tell us something. Share with us an insight. But the Talmud says it's not that Moses didn't elaborate. He didn't give them long lectures. He didn't give them long speeches. Generally, Moses didn't give long speeches and long sermons. But, I quote, we quoted the Talmud before in source number one. Not a single word. And what's the reason? They were weary from their journey. Now let's understand, this makes the question even stronger. Because the journey from Rafidim to Mount Sinai is relatively speaking a short journey. Not a long journey. Number two, according to Rabbi Yaisi, it was Sunday. They just rested yesterday, Shabbos. We know that the commandment of Shabbos was given earlier in Mara, and the Talmud cites two opinions. According to one of the opinions, the commandment of Tchumen, not to travel excessively on Shabbos, was also given earlier. That means the day before they rested 24 hours. 
So this was not a long, stretched out journey. Even according to the sages, it was Monday. So they traveled on Sunday, but they didn't travel on Shabbos, according to that opinion, that the mitzvah of techumen, of not traveling excessively on Shabbos, was also presented before the giving of the Torah, as the Talmud discusses there in Shrakta Shabbos. But even if they were exhausted and weary, how do we understand the fact that Moses would say nothing and the Jews would demand to know nothing? This question was raised by the Lubavitcher Rebbe at a gathering, a public gathering of Habrengen, as it's known in Yiddish, Shabbos, the portion of Bamidbar, Tovshin Mem Gimel, 1983. And tonight, I want to share with you, albeit briefly, the explanation, the insight that the Lubavitcher Rebbe presented and suggested to answer this question. To understand what happened on that day, let's examine in a clearer fashion the events of that day. This is the first day of the month of Sivan. The Jewish people traveled from Rifidim and they arrived to the desert of Sinai. Now, for the next days, they would stand here, prepare for the giving of the Torah, which would happen on the sixth day on Shabbos. They arrive Monday, the giving of the Torah is on Shabbos. Again, we know this other opinion, Rabbi Yossi. They arrived Sunday, the giving of the Torah is on Shabbos. What happened on that first day? The Torah describes it in source number four. Bring up source number four. We have here those verses, Exodus chapter 19, Parshas Yisra, Perikites. Ba'chodesh ha'shlishi l'tzeiz b'nei Yisrael meretz Mitzrayim ba'yoy mazah bo'o midbar Sinai. On the third month from when the Jewish people left the land of Egypt, on this day, they arrived to the Sinai Desert. By Yoim Hazet, on this day. As Rav explains in Mesech the Shabbos, Tractate Shabbos, Daf Pevov Amid Beis, by Yoim Hazet, this day refers to the first day of the month. Rosh Chodesh, he makes what's called Agzei Reshava, Hazet, Hazet. Two equal words are used in Parshas Boy, in Parshas Yisrael, there Hazer refers to the first day of the month, here too Hazer refers to the first day of the month. So on the first day of the month of Sivan, the third month of the Jewish calendar, Nisan, Ir, Sivan is the third, they arrive to the Sinai Desert. And the Torah continues, Vayisu Mirifidim, Vayavoyu Midbar Sinai, they traveled from a place called Rifidim, they arrived to the Sinai Desert, Vayachanu Ba Midbar, and they encamped in the desert, Vayichan Shom Yisrael Negedahar. There, Israel rested parallel to the mountain, Mount Sinai. Comes Rashi in source number five, please open source number five, and is perturbed by a grammatical question. The Jewish people numbered hundreds of thousands, millions indeed. And yet the grammar the Torah uses is Vayichan Sham Yisrael. Vayichan is singular. Grammatically, it should have said, Vayachanu in plural. The Jewish people rested. They rested parallel to the mountain. They camped in the desert. Yet the Torah says, Vayichan, he camped. He dwelled as though we are referring to one person. So Rashi, quoting the famous Mechilta, the famous Midrash, Vayichan sham Yisrael, ki echad Like one human being with one heart. While all the other encampments were were performed with strife and argumentation and divisiveness. So the Torah, by making this change in grammar from Vayachanu to Vayichan, not they dwelled, but he dwelled, is intimating to us that thousands and millions of people were transformed. They became like one person, one man with one heart. So on all of them you could say he dwelled because they became united. Where in all the other times they came places, they were fighting, they were arguing, they were divisive. Now let's try to understand what this, this means. As the Torah describes in the 33rd chapter of Numbers, the end of Bamidbar, portion of Masay, the Jewish people throughout their 40 years in the desert made 42 stops. There were Membez Masas, 42 journeys. They stopped, they stayed in 42 places. 
Rashi tells us here that all of the places they were fighting. Now, the truth is, if you read the Bible, if you study the Torah, you know there was a lot of quarreling. There was many arguments and mutinies and rebellion, rebellion and, and issues and struggles constantly. But to say that every single time they were, they were fighting, Rashi says, every single time they came somewhere, they were always fighting. Now, you know Jews, I know Jews, we know that Jews are good at arguing. Right? They say two Jews, 19 opinions. But what does this mean? It's a little hard to understand that every single time they came somewhere, there was again strife and divisiveness. The meaning, however, according to the interpretation of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, is deeper. Not necessarily does this machloikis refer to actual fighting with animosity, with envy, with hatred, with disdain, but rather it may be more subtle and more sophisticated. What we call in our literature and the ethics of our fathers, machloikis l'shem shamayim, which means arguments for the sake of heaven. The way God created humanity is, as the Talmud tells us elsewhere, a mission and tractate Sanhedrin 37a, Lamed Zion, ain de yisei in Shavis, ain parts of in Shavis. No two faces are alike. And no two mindsets are alike. No two people think the same. No two people experience life the same. It's one of the most important and difficult and critical things to understand about dealing with people. Every person experiences life differently. People may see the same facts, but the way they deal with it, the way they absorb it, their conclusions are different. Ain't they saying, Shavos? The Kotzke Rebbe once said that the reason the Mishnah juxtaposes the two, he says, do you ever get angry about the fact that your friend doesn't look like you? Do you ever get upset about the fact that he or she doesn't have the same color eyes or nose, size of the nose or your facial features or your physique? On the contrary, you're happy to be an individual, especially if you think you look good. You don't want other people to look just like you. You or you? So he says, why do you get upset if somebody thinks differently than you? Part of understanding civilization is different mindsets and this is inherent to existence diversity of the psyche is inherent to existence and any attempt to make people think alike is destined to disaster that's one of the great lessons of history and that's where the Mishnah says it and the Torah itself is based on this truth the Torah always discusses the fact that there's different opinions and different perspectives in fact there's a fascinating statement in the Talmud which says this is in, in Yerushalmi, Sanhedrin, and Medrash Tillam. It says, The words of Torah were not given in a one-dimensional fashion. Every single law, every single thing, there's 49 perspectives to say it's pure, and 49 perspectives to say it's impure. And Elu Ve'elu Divri Elakim Chayim. Both are the words of the living God, the, Torah, the Talmud tells us in Erev. Both. Both opinions are the word of the living God. In other words, God also is not one-dimensional. So when we say the Jewish people argued, and they had tarumas and machleikas, it doesn't necessarily mean an argument that was narcissistic and, and self-centered and destructive. Rather, it means every person is different. And every person has a different perspective and a different mindset and a different way of looking at everything. And therefore... They develop different approaches to life, to Torah, to God, to Judaism, to themselves, and to everything that was going on. And this is part of human nature which God created. created. And that's why the attempt to nullify it is a human attempt and nullifies something that's inherent to existence, which is diversity. What happened here on the first day of the month of Sivan then was an absolutely unprecedented and revolutionary concept. It's not just the Jewish people weren't killing each other. It's not just they weren't hollering at each other, screaming at each other, because we established that at many other camps, they also weren't fighting this way. What happened was something else. Despite the fact that people are so different, and despite the fact that everyone understands 
things in their own unique and individualistic way. Nonetheless, here they united, Kiish Echad Belev Echad, they became like one man with one heart. And there are two aspects here. We can behave like one person in the sense that we all follow the same course of action, but in our hearts we're still different. Here, it's not only they became like one person, also with one heart. In other words, even internally, emotionally, they became one. And this was the unique phenomenon that transpired on the first day of the month of Siv. Now, in order to understand what created this type of unity, what was it that allowed them to experience this type of unity? We have to delve in to one more theme and understand what exactly happened at Mount Sinai. There is something strange about this whole event when we reflect upon it in our own sources. The fact is, tradition has it that the ideas and wisdom of Torah was studied for generations before the Torah was given on Sinai. In fact, the mitzvahs, the commandments were also known and were also observed by some individuals. And I'll give you an example. Take a look at source number six. Bring up source number six, a Talmud in Yuma. Yuma Daf Chav Ches Amit Beis, 28. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all sat and studied Torah in their yeshivas, in their academic institutes of Torah. And the Talmud continues, Abraham, our father, observed the entire Torah, and even the midst of Eir Tavshil, which is a rabbinic commandment which has to do with the fact that if the holidays are leading into Shabbos, let's say you have a holiday that is Thursday and Friday and Shabbos, and you're usually not allowed to cook on the holidays for the next day, you could only cook food on the holiday to eat that day, but not for the next day. So the rabbis commanded us to make an Erev Tavshilin, which is start cooking the food for Shabbos on Wednesday, the day before the holiday. This is called Erev Tavshilin, but it's beyond the scope of tonight's class. Avram Avinu observed even this. God says, Abraham observed my Torahs, plurally, the written Torah and even the oral traditions. If this is the case, it would mean that when the Torah was given, nothing qualitatively happened. It was only an issue of quantity. Prior to that, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob studied the Torah and observed the mitzvahs of the Torah. And in each generation, there were a few Jews who did it. And now, it was a message that was introduced to the masses. But qualitatively, nothing happened. The Torah was studied before, and the mitzvahs were studied before. Now, it's true that the Torah that was studied before were obviously the ideas of the Torah, not the actual text of Torah, which chronicles many events that occurred after the patriarchs. The mitzvahs is the idea of the mitzvahs. But the point is, however you're going to want to explain the format of the wisdom of Torah and mitzvahs that they observed, there was a body of wisdom and literature and rituals and law that was practiced and studied by the patriarchs, the matriarchs, the tribes, and so on and so forth. What then happened at Mount Sinai? Fanfare, lightning and fire and smoke and chauffeur, an unprecedented, unprecedented historical event where the Jewish people were given the Torah that was there previously. The answer is captured in two words. The event at Sinai is called Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah. 
Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah. And that captures the idea. Prior to the giving of the Torah at Sinai, people studied the Torah. Orally, the traditions they had, whatever text they had. But everybody studied it with the tools of their own intellect. And therefore they could grasp as much as their own intellect and mind allowed them to grasp. Every single person's mind has its own parameters, its own boundaries, its own capabilities, its strengths and its weaknesses. As we said, everyone's mind functions differently. So everybody studied Torah and they grasped of the Torah whatever they could grasp according to their intellectual capacity. Obviously, nobody could grasp the entirety of Torah, which is God's wisdom, because just as God is infinite, His wisdom is also infinite, so, and the human mind is finite, so no human mind could grasp the entirety of Torah, but the human intellect grasped whatever it was capable of grasping from the literature and the wisdom of Torah according to its own tools. What happened at the giving of the Torah at Sinai was God gave us the Torah. He gave us the Torah in its entirety, meaning he imbued himself into the Torah. When I'm reading, say, a brilliant book of a scientist or a philosopher, I read it. What do I grasp of it? I grasp of it whatever my mind is capable of grasping, and therefore ideas that were communicated from this author who transcribed this book. So whatever ideas I'm capable of grasping, I grasp and internalize, and I could say that I have a relationship with some ideas communicated by this author. It may be a small fragment of the ideas. I may be incapable of grasping it in its totality, or it may be more of it. What happened at the to- giving of the Torah at Sinai was the great miracle that God took, so to speak, his very essence, his very self, and he imbued it and he incorporated, into the, incorporated it into the Torah that he gave to the Jewish people. And the Talmud describes this fascinatingly in a line. Source number seven, the Talmud says, Tractate Shabbos, Daf Kuf Hayamad Aleph 105a, Rabbi Yochanan says, Anoichi, the first word of the Ten Commandments is Anoichi, which means I am. Anoichi is Nutrikin, is an acronym, Ano Nafshi Ksavis Yehavis. Ano means mine, I, mine, Nafshi, my soul. Ksavis, I wrote into it. Yehavis, I gave into it. In other words, Anoichi is Anna, my soul, God says, my essence, Ksavis, I, so to speak, transcribed and imparted and imbued into the Torah I give to the Jewish people. Or the Medrash gives us a metaphor for this in source number eight. The Medrash Rabbah says in Truma, Sometimes you sell something. And when you sell a certain product, you get sold together with the product. I sold you my Torah. It's not just I sold you my house, my car, my book, my wisdom. I sold myself with it. You've now purchased me. There was a king who had a single daughter. One of the kings came and married this single princess. He had a one daughter. This young king wanted to go back to his land with his new wife. The king told him, the father of the princess. She's my only daughter. I cannot separate from her. But I also can't tell you, don't take her. She is your wife. Wherever you go, I need you to designate a special suite in your home for me because I cannot leave my daughter. This is the source that mothers-in-law and fathers-in-law make sure to come visit 
their sons-in-law and in-laws and have make sure you have your suite because I can't leave my daughter with you. I have to come visit. Kach Amar Hakadosh Baruch Yisrael. God tells Israel, Nasati lechem asatayda. Lifrishe menei niyach. Loi malachem al titlu niyach. Lo bechal mokim shatam holchem bayis echad asuli shadur besoiches namer vasel emikdash. I gave you the Torah, my my daughter. I cannot separate from her. I can't tell you not to take it. Wherever you go, I need you to make a home for me because I'm going to be there. Which, of course, what the Medrash is saying here is the Torah is not just a piece of literature with laws. Do this, don't do this. Or with different ideas of wisdom. The Torah is more than that. The Torah is something that has within it God's very intimate presence and essence. So from the day the Torah was given, the Jewish people studied Torah not just as a text or a manual to know the laws, to know the instructions. They studied Torah like somebody studies a love letter. You're out there far drafted to war or far away on a trip and you receive a letter from somebody who loves you with all their heart. And you go to a place, and you open the letter, and you read it, and you read it again, and yet again, and every time you read it, you find new insight. And suddenly, as you're reading the letter, you can hear the voice of the person who wrote the letter, and you could feel their presence, and experience their breath, and touch their soul through these words. It's not just a bill in the mail. It's not just information. I'm going here, I'm going there. How are you doing? What's happening? It's words through which you feel the voice, the presence, the soul of the person you love and therefore you hold on to the letter. You don't throw it away. You'll read it again and every time you'll see new things because what you see in the letter is the person who wrote the letter. This is the experience of Torah in Jewish history, in the Jewish mind. It's not just Jews studied Torah and they knew what to do. They knew Jewish law, Jewish perspectives, Jewish wisdom, Jewish religious insight. That's true, but there was something more essential about Torah. There is something more essential about Torah. That when a Jew opens up Torah, he feels as a nemdem eibrishtah. He's not just studying an idea, rather he's capturing God himself, as the Medrash puts it there in Truman, Tanchuma, I see atom like him. You don't only have my daughter, it's me that you're taking. It's me that you're grasping. The Jew opened up a Blad Gemara, a page of Talmud. The Jew opened up a chapter of Mishnayis. The Jew opened up a Pasuk Chumash. The Jew opened up a work of Jewish law, any work of Torah. It wasn't only he or she was studying and absorbing ideas, laws, rituals, commandments, arguments, perspectives. Rather, he or she felt that they're embracing God himself who put himself into the Torah. That's the reason why throughout history you'll see the Jewish people were instructed, and this is how they did it, they would study different aspects of Torah, even those that weren't relevant practically. For example, a major occupation of Torah study are laws that are relevant to the temple, to sacrifices, to ritual purity, which are completely not practical for nowadays. And studied with the same passion and the same enthusiasm like Torah that's relevant to today practically. And the reason is, you know, (laughs) when you're hanging out with somebody you love, it's no difference where you are. No difference if you're in the rain, no difference if you're in the house, no difference if you go to this place, if you go to that place. It's not about where you are, it's about with whom you are. But when you go out with somebody you don't like so much, now it's a major issue. Where we're going? We're going to eat in a dairy restaurant, we're going to eat in a deli restaurant. We're going to spend the day outdoors, or we're going to spend the day indoors. We're going to go here, or we're going to go there. And it becomes a major issue and sometimes even a major argument. I want to go here, you want to go here. We're going to go shopping, or it's leisure. If you really enjoy a person, what's the difference? Wherever you are, you're having a great time. It's not where you are, it's who you're with. When it's not about who you're with, suddenly, oh, what are we doing? For the Jewish people, the Torah was their love most intimate experience with God. So what's the difference where? What's the difference if I'm learning Mesech the Brachas Shabbos or Mesech the Zvachim Anachas? What's the difference where I am? It's who I'm with. 
All of Torah is one love letter. The Talmud has an expression, a b'raisa t'esef, the kola Torah kula inyan echa. The whole Torah is one theme. It also means intellectually the whole Torah is one theme, but also spiritually it's one love letter expressed in different words and in different ways. That didn't happen before the Torah was given. Before the Torah was given, everyone approached Torah from their own scholarly limitations and perspective, how much they can grasp. That's what you get. What happened when the Torah was given is matan Torah. God gave the whole Torah to every single Jew because he put himself into that Torah. That was the great miracle that happened at the giving of the Torah. God took, so to speak, his very essence and imbued it in every aspect and law and word and dimension and thought of Torah that would be studied by any single Jew throughout all of the generations. What is he grasping? He's grasping not just a piece of literature, he's grasping the intimacy of the divine, God himself. That's why Torah has so much significance in Jewish life, unparalleled in any other culture or civilization. If it would only be a book of laws, a constitution, that's what it would be. So lawyers who need, a, who, need, who need to know, lawyers and judges who need to know the constitution would study Torah. Torah is a commandment for every Jew to study, a child and an adult, young and old, everyone. Because Torah is more than that. It's like a metaphor the Lubavitcher Rebbe once gave, Shavuos, you know, a child comes home. He's been away for a long time. Comes home, opens the door, sees his mother, sees his father. First thing he does, runs into their arms to get a hug. Drew comes home from work, he had a hard day, stressful, bills, issues, challenges, struggles. You come home, what's the first thing that you do? You run to grab and embrace your father and mother. So what's the first thing the Jew does? He opens up a Gemara, he opens up a book of Torah to embrace his father. It's not just words, it's not just wisdom. He's embracing God. That's what happened at the giving of the Torah. So there's two aspects in the giving of the Torah. One is the individualistic relationship every single Jew has with Torah based on their character, their intellectual capacity, their spiritual sensibility, based on everyone's individual identity. There's another aspect of Torah. The fact that God imbued his essence into the Torah, this is something that defies differences between Jews. The difference between one Jew and another Jew is only in their intellectual appreciation and experience of Torah and how much they can grasp of it. What Moses understands is not what I understand or you understand. And what a great, brilliant scholar understands is far more than a simpleton understands. But as far as the isiyatim like, the embrace of the divine that you experience in the study of Torah, that transcends differences. In that experience, every single person is the same. We both, are equally removed from God's essence, which transcends any human comprehension. So Moses, the greatest human being, and the smallest human being, are equally removed from experiencing God's essence, which transcends all human boundaries and parameters. And both of us equally receive the gift of Torah in which God imbued his essence. And whether a person, a child, is learning a posik, a simple verse in Torah, a simple verse in Chumash, and a great Talmud Chacham, a great Torah scholar, is delving into profound ideas of Kabbalah, or Hasidism, or Talmud, or Midrash, or Jewish law, and Jewish responsa, in the intellectual appreciation, and comprehension, and application, and ramifications, you can't compare the two. What does the six-year-old child understand versus what this great mind appreciates and comprehends? But in touching the divine, in the fact that God imbued himself into the Torah, that they both touch identically.
So in the preparations of the Jewish people to receiving the Torah, there were two stages. One stage is the personalized individual preparation, every person based on their identity to be able to absorb the Torah according to their own capacity. Another preparation and a preliminary preparation was actually the suspension of self, the passive openness to a gift that transcends everybody equally and therefore encompasses everybody equally. I'll tell you an interesting story. It's painful, but very, very telling. A few years ago, I think it was two years ago, a, a journalist in Israel died. He was a writer for the Ma'ariv newspaper. His name was Adam Baruch. Adam Baruch was a very interesting writer. He grew up in the yeshiva. And then he left uh, the path of religious life, of observance. And he became a very popular writer in Israel. I was reading, after he died, the obituaries, different articles about him. So one of the newspapers reported that one of the key factors that caused them to leave the world of Yiddishkeit, to leave the world of Torah was, he was a young yeshiva student in a yeshiva, and it was Simcha's Torah, and he was dancing with the Torah, very enthusiastically, very passionately, and he was dancing for a long time, and he wouldn't stop. His Rosh Yeshiva, <laughs> the dean of his yeshiva, calls him over, it was a certain type of yeshiva, and he tells him these words. He says, Based on the measure, on the amount of Torah that you studied this year, you danced enough. In fact, you're now dancing more than the amount of Torah that you studied during the year. And this insulted him very badly. It, felt, it made him feel so bad. He was so happy with the Torah and dancing. And then he got this clop, the psychological blow. And according to this writer, this was a, at least a factor, a major factor, a one factor, probably one of many, which caused them to, to leave the yeshiva world. I read this story and I reminded myself that once Simcha's Torah at a public gathering the Lubavitcher Rebbe told a story that the Rebbe Levi Yitzchak of Barditchev, the great Hasidic master, saw a simple Jew dancing with the Torah and some Torah enthusiastically. So he asked him, I understand somebody who dedicated their whole year to study Torah, they're excited, they completed the Torah, they're dancing. But you, you're a simple person, and you're not a great scholar, and you're not really a student of Torah. This was a Jew who was illiterate, who can barely read Hebrew. Why are you dancing? And the Jew turns to the Baditshava and he says, Rebbe, I don't understand you. If my brother is marrying off a daughter, I shouldn't dance at the wedding because it's not my daughter. My brother is marrying off a daughter. He says, I may not be learning, but my brother is marrying off a daughter, so I'm dancing. And the Baditshava loved his answer. So the Lubavitcher Rebbe said that really, the Jew is wrong. It's not his brother who's marrying off a daughter. It's his own wedding. It's his own daughter's wedding. Why? Because there's two elements in the relationship between the Jew and Torah. As far as the intellectual experience, every person is different, and you can't compare the great scholar to the illiterate person. But then there's something else. The fact that God gave the Torah to every single Jew, and he imbued his essence in the gift. It's not just a gift of words. It's his gift. He's in the gift. And a Jew who learns one verse grasps the essence like a great scholar who learns the whole Talmud by heart. That everyone has identical. Now we'll understand the deeper story in the Talmud. When the Talmud says that on the first day of the month of Sivan, they all came to the mountain and they were like one man with one heart. And Moses did not tell them anything because they were weary of their journey. It doesn't only mean, as people think literally, there was nothing going on the day that nothing happened. So we asked a good question. Why? They were waiting for this. Why not say a word? This was part of the preparation for the Torah and it was deeper 
than the preparation of the next five days. The preparation of the following days were preparations based on their own identity and individuality, everyone preparing themselves through the different methods discussed the next days. The first day preparation, how did Moses prepare them? Through silence. It was not through words, it was through silence. It was through the surrender of self to something that completely transcends the self. Because what's the preparation? for this great gift of God's essence, not through assertion of your individuality, but rather through a complete surrender that you're ready now to be able to embrace the infinite as it is in all spiritual growth. The first stage is surrender. You have to open yourself up completely, become an empty vessel, and then you can begin incorporating. The first day the month of, of the month of Sivan, it's not that Moses didn't tell them anything it's the, and didn't prepare them for the Torah. Rather, what he articulated that, that to them that day was not something you articulate through words. It's something you articulate through silence. It's something you articulate not through assertion, but through self-abnegation. Not through self-expression, but through self-transcendence. Not through verbal communication, but through the absence of words. Because of the weariness of their journey. There are two types of journeys. A physical journey, there's a mental journey. Mental journeys are sometimes more difficult than physical journeys. Going from one space to another space mentally may be very, very difficult. What the Talmud here means that they were weary of their journey is not just the physical journey. It's the journey to be able to transcend their individual selves and become one person with one heart was an excruciatingly difficult journey. Different type of journey, a mental journey. And that was the reason for their exhaustion. It was the mental journey to be able to reach this space. But there's something deeper. What type of mental journey was it? A journey which allows you to transcend yourself, to be able to experience that which is beyond yourself. That's chul shadu'urcha. It's the weariness of the journey. The journey consisted of weariness. This journey was a journey from self to selflessness, from self-assertion to self-transcendence, from self-expression to self-forgetfulness, from words to silence. It's a journey in which you become weak, in which you become open, in which you become empty, in which you go beyond yourself to be able to hear the message of the one that loves you, to be able to hear the voice behind the love letter, to be able to hug the person you love. This was the journey of weakness, weakness in the sense of self-suspension, opening yourself up to something completely beyond yourself. And how do you do that? Not through words, but through silence. And that was the greatest preparation. To the day they came to Mount Sinai, the first preparation was, Moses did not tell them a single word. We're not talking about that he didn't tell them a single word in the sense that they forgot what's going on. This was the preparation. The preparation was the articulation of the deepest silence. Because to experience the essence of God, what you need is silence, not words. After the day one, now came the next stage. The next stage was to assert themselves and everybody to prepare their own identity, their own mind and their own heart to receive the Torah. The first stage you need is open yourself up to love. Open yourself up to a gift that transcends you completely. Open yourself up to the embrace of God. Open yourself up as an empty, hollow vessel without any ego. But you don't remain there. Now you have to be able to internalize it and incorporate it into your day-to-day -day character, into your identity. Torah is not just about suspension of self. Torah is about assertion of your mind, internalization, appreciation, articulation, words and words and more words. But for the words to be words that embrace the essence, the words have to be followed by silence. Have a good night.